military-industrial complex. And now, the Taliban will pay a price. Do we have the confidence to do in the Middle East what our fathers and grandfathers accomplished in Europe and Asia? The situation in Afghanistan is deteriorating. What I do oppose is a dumb war. Okay, welcome back uh, after what we've been gone two weeks now. So uh, welcome back to the boardwalk, everybody. We are happy to be joined with joined today by our good friend, Mr. Dan Catlin, who was a founding member of the Charts LLC that never really took off, although $14 trillion doled out by the Defense Department. Maybe we should have jumped on some of that. So Dan, thanks for uh, being on here with us today. We're going to be doing that fun stuff, talking about Aruzgan and the Khan family and how that all ties into the to the war in Afghanistan. So welcome. Hadn't seen you in a little while, so it's great to have you on here. Um, do you want to provide like a very brief introduction to who is like who is Dan, really? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, no, so thanks for the intro. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, uh, for my past, uh, you know, I joined the army when I was 20, did that for uh, just under five years, and then went to Afghanistan and met these guys in Kandahar, which was a great time. Founded charts, but, you know, obviously, we're still still working on that. Still, still, still in the pipeline coming up here. We'll see. Um, yeah, still, still doing some contracting uh here or there so still kind of in in the field a little bit but uh now working as a data scientist and yeah that's a quick overview of who i am kind of my background without getting into too many details all right um so we we wanted to talk about aruzgan because i know so far we've talked a lot about kandahar obviously uh, a little bit about helmand and then just afghanistan as a whole and we've kind of just glanced over Ruzgan. And I think when you look at the, the war in Afghanistan and it's in its 20 year entirety, you have to talk about that province because a, there, that province was a lot more important. I think than people realize when you look at the connection with Karzai, which we'll get into the, the Khan family, which we'll get into and just how the, uh, the cultural norms there helped, um, help the Taliban reinforce their control in that area. So uh, I, I guess the, the the starting point is uh, Aruzgan is the, the province directly to the north of Kandahar. And uh, in 2004, they took like, what, two thirds of the province and turned it into Dekundi because that was completely Shia Hazara. And so you had a, you went from having a province that was roughly 50-50 between Hazara and non-Hazara to a country with still some Hazaras, but not a lot, mostly uh, members of the Gilzai Pashtun tribes. Um, and and one, of, one of the things that, it, that stayed there with the Hazaras leaving was you have a, I, I think Aruzgan might be like culturally the most conservative province, like in, in Afghan terms, right? When we talk about that, that cultural Afghan that like we've talked about in some of the episodes regarding, um, you know, how they view Islam and Pashtun Wali. And, uh, you know, a great example is if you did read No Good Men Among the Living, where the, the main female, I guess you can call her a protagonist, or one of, one of the, the, the main characters, her husband is killed and she comes out and she's crying over her husband's dead body and women and men alike are telling her to you know keep her voice down because men can't hear her because she'll bring shame to her family uh that's that's kind of what a is you know it's it's very rural it's very uh culturally conservative it's i i would argue that it was increasingly taliban friendly and in large part one due to us trying to play sides with the tribes, but then just things that the Afghan government did, things that our military did. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, I guess we got our video up and running, but uh, yeah, Dan. Uh, so you worked as an Aruzgan analyst for a while, right? That was like, I think you got moved over uh, some other place for for a little bit. Can you remind me? Because it's been a while, been a few years. Yeah. So I kind of bounced around uh, like as like the team flexed 
in strength and flexed in, you know, who, what analyst did what and, you know, who was, was or was not fired, depending on, you know, how you view it. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think I fit, like, if I remember correctly, I think I finished with the Ruzgan and Dukundi. Um, but I, if I remember right, I'd started on Zobel. And then you, you were definitely in Zobel for a while. I, I remember yeah. you mostly being in Zobel, but yeah. And then like, I, I think at the end, because, uh, was it Brandon? No, Brandon was on Kandahar. Mm-hmm. I, I forget. I, yeah. So at the end I had Ruse gone in Dekundi before I left. And then I, uh, I'm not sure who took over for it after that. Um, yeah, Stu. Stu did. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so by the by the time I came in, you were on Aruzgan and Dekundi, and I sort of slid in to to replace you afterwards. So. Right. Yeah. So I I really watched it for probably five to six months uh, there at the end of the tour that that I did. Um, and during that time, yeah, it, was, it you know to kind of reflect on some of the more conservative. Re- side of things like i think definitely those kind of reports are were fairly common coming out of there um i can know you guys did the episode on the uh on the t-boys that and like those reports came out of uru's gone yeah so it was yeah it was, it was definitely a little different than zabel just because you know with zabel you had the main highway going through there and so there's a lot of focus on the main cities along the highway and then with ru gone you had route bear and then like the t like, I guess I viewed it as a T-intersection because you had the route going south into Kandahar, which was the main highway, and then the uh, the east-west route uh, that connected the rest of the province. And, I mean, for the entire time that we watched it, that north-south highway to Kandahar was blocked, and then they tried to build around it, around the blockage, because that was simpler than just clearing the route. Um, and then it was like, you know, month by month, it was just, you know, they would constantly lose the section of the highway. So, it was yeah, it was a very... It's a very bleak time to be watching it uh, when I was. It was like if you ever played like, you know, like the computer war games and you have like supply lines. The whole issue with the Ruzgan was that most of the supplies came, of course, north along that route, the one route really into a Ruzgan. So, um, so, so yeah, basically like there, there's this supply blockage and you have all these A and A, A and P up in, up in a Ruzgan who aren't getting supplied because the route hasn't been cleared. It's never opened. Uh, ever since uh, Mariola Khan died, really, that, that route has just been constantly closed off by the Taliban. So I think we'll get just, we'll probably get into talking about the Khan family. I know we've touched on them a little bit about in, uh, before in this podcast. But, but yeah, opening that route was kind of the story of our time there, at least with the Aruzgan Kandahar Highway. I, I feel like that, that was a huge issue uh, while we were there, just lack of supply into Aruzgan. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, we I, I, like like not to rehash all the episodes you guys have already done, but there was also the issue with the Gulf soldiers. Where like we're not even sure, you know, how many like how many of the reports of attacks that we were getting were actually true, and like you know how much supplies they were actually losing. You know, there was yeah, it was like it was a constant supply issue from from what we were being told. Uh, you know, and the truth of the matter of what on the ground, like what the actual ground situation was like, we, we can never verify just because by that time, um, we'd pulled back. Like, like I don't think there were any U S forces in Ruzgan when, when we were there, I think they completely pulled out. So it was, you know, we just had to take, uh, the word of the ANA and the ANP up there. But, you know, I think in a lot of ways we, you know, that trust was broken at that time. Yeah. I mean, there, there was, there was so much wrong with, with what was going on in the ruse gun. I think um, a lot, a lot of it does stem from that highway, right? Like we, I, like you said, Dan, we don't want to hash on it too much, but that the Taliban taking that highway, it, I don't think it, it changed the outcome or any of the outcomes that happened in a ruse gun, but I think it accelerated the outcomes. Uh, they first took it in May of 2016, like two months before I got there. But the, uh, the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces was able; they were able to retake the highway, and then it was a couple months later, like was it September, October timeframe, where they they took that highway for good, and they didn't even take the highway in Aruzgan, right? They took the highway in Shawali Khat district in northern Kandahar, right. 
And once that happened and the Afghan military was uh, relegated to using a, a path that they cleared with a bulldozer on mud and dirt and rocks going up a mountain range into a Ruzgan, which just slowed down any and all transportation, it, it just gave the Taliban so much more time. Right. And in an insurgency, the more time you have, the better off you're going to be, especially as the insurgents. Right? It got to the point when we ultimately eeped up there. Right. I think it was after you left. And I think um, they sent a, an eat package up there, which is just like the commander and a couple a, a couple platoons like going up there to mm. to have an exchange with whoever the hell they went to go talk to. Like they went to Fob Tarrant and. I'm not even, I, I assume they talked to whoever the damn commander was up there and like nothing got accomplished, but they went up there. It, it's a show of force, right? It's the whole thing was, let's show the Taliban that we're, that we're still able to come up here. But by then they figured out that we weren't going to go up there and stay up there. It wasn't, it wasn't just the route coming up from, so, so I, I got there in October and basically like right before and during my, my initial time in Kandahar um, or at, at CAF, um, Aruzgan essentially like like almost fully <laughs> fell to the Taliban. It was like the culmination of months and months of uh, Taliban operations, and the the final pin was the uh, the the fall of uh, the route leading up from Kandahar to Aruzgan. But basically, um, you have uh, Tarankat, which is the uh, district capital of Aruzgan province and the Taliban essentially took all of the connecting valleys from the provincial capital to the surrounding districts and held them for for months and months and I, I think it ended up being years so the surrounding districts were completely cut off from support from the provincial capital and then the provincial capital was cut off from support from uh, Kandahar which they they really relied on and so yeah, the situation basically devolved into um, these like district level A uh, and A uh, and um, Afghan police trying to hold their ground while you know losing resources day by day and uh, not being able to to really branch out. So essentially, a lot of the districts basically shrank down with the um, uh, the. Afghans losing ground to the uh, Taliban to the point where several of them were only holding their district centers. So when we talk about Aruzgan, and it's probably just the green and white uh, analyst in me, but we have to talk about the Khan family who basically controlled it from the start of the war on to our time in there. At the beginning of the war, we, we basically uh, made, and we've talked about it on this podcast quite a bit, we basically made deals with power brokers in the region to um, help identify uh, terrorists. I use terrorists with air quotes there. Um, but basically, uh, in exchange for, you know, holding and in, in securing regions, you know, these power brokers would be friendly with the United States for providing them lists of uh, terrorists and enemies, enemies of the United States, supposedly. Well, these enemies of the United States usually just ended up being personal enemies of, of what whoever was buddy-buddy with us. So uh, one of those guys... You know, in kind of the same vein as Galaga Shurzai and Kandahar, who we've talked about before, is John Muhammad Khan and Aruz Khan. I don't know if we really delved into this. I know I have a podcast, an old podcast that I had talking about John Muhammad Khan and his and his nephew and then his nephew's son. But um, John Muhammad was the, the governor of Aruz Khan, um, and he would just give us the names of enemies of his and then special forces would go light them up. So... John Muhammad Khan was not uh, very well liked among most of the population because he was essentially a tyrant. Um, but when we talk about Aruzgan, we talk about uh, the route, you know, the route from Kandahar to Aruzgan. Well, that was pretty much secured by uh, John Muhammad's nephew, uh, Mariola Khan. And there's a great Atlantic piece. Uh, I think it's an Atlantic piece on, on Mariola Khan and about the, the really sketchy almost private military company he had that would escort convoys like a cost per truck along that route. And, um, when he was working for us, you know, um, as much of a maniac as he was, he, uh, he did keep the route open. So he was able to keep 
soldiers and ANA and Anna Ruzgan supplied. He was killed uh, by a Taliban assassin, I think, uh, probably right before we got there, 2015, 2016-ish. I think he was he was killed while I was there doing aviation and completely oblivious to what's going on in Ruzgan. But um, yeah, after after his death, Rob, uh, you know, the route just fell apart. So um, Matt Hill Khan is, is one of those like damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of things that kept it together. But I don't know. We yeah. can probably say a lot about him. Yeah, and and John Muhammad Khan, you know, like like many of the the warlords we we worked with, you're correct. He was, you know, kind of a tyrant, but he was also a fairly important figure in uh, Karzai's life. He was he was actually a huge uh, mentor figure for Karzai as he was growing up, and um, he hugely respected him. And in fact, one of the earliest operations that we we did in uh, in southern Afghanistan was. A, uh, it was either a special forces or SEAL team went up and um, rescued John Muhammad Khan at the behest of Karzai. And from from there, he was able to regain control of Aruzgan from the Taliban. And that ultimately led to our initial capture of Kandahar as we were uh, as we were starting to take the country back from the uh, from the Taliban in like 2002. Yeah, so he um, big time player. Yeah, John Muhammad Khan, like he was a you know original Mujahideen guy. Uh, lost his eye during the Soviet Afghan War. Has never he never really gave a, a straight answer as to how he lost it. So he could have pulled like a John Kerry trying to get a Purple Heart. Who knows? Um, I don't know if that's true or not with John Kerry. Uh, probably not. But after after the after the Soviet Afghan War, he becomes the the governor of Aruzgan, right? That's where he's from. It's his ancestral home. Uh, he was very close with Bernud and Rabani, who was the mentor to Ahmad Shah Massoud and Gobind and Hekmatyar. And uh, he held that post for like four years, and then he had the Taliban uprising, and he spends was it like the next five six years in jail, whatever it is. And like you said, Stu Karzai comes in, releases him, and I really like this in. In the non in the Nan Gopal's No Good Men among, among the Living, it's like after he was released from jail, he ceased to be Ja Muhammad Khan and became JMK. Right? Like this 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 different figure, this this larger than life personality. And I think for Afghanistan, that's that's a fair thing to say, right? He is he's a tribal minority, because the Pulpazai were not the tribal majority in Aruzgan. He's a tribal minority who is running Aruzgan province. Like even without De Kundi, they're not the they're not the majority tribe. And He's not, you're right, Kyle. Like he's not very well liked. If if you're a part of his his circle, inner or just his circle indirect, life's probably really good for you. But if you're not a part of that circle, yeah, life is probably extremely shitty. And you've had you have to worry about, excuse me, especially in 2002, 2003, is there going to get you know, you know, are you going to have a team of fucking seals barge through your your hut at two o'clock in the morning and take you away because you slighted the governor on accident? You know, like he he did rule with an iron fist, um, but he and Matiula kept that fucking highway open, and so we, like we we turned a blind eye to it. And you know, I, I think somebody, I remember uh, somebody saying a, a quote regarding Razak, like he's the son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch. And I think that probably applied to the cons, at least mm -hmm. uh, John Muhammad and and uh, Matiula, because as as terrible of people as they were like because jama you know, jmk is probably one of the more notorious abusers of uh prepubescent boys um within modern afghan history and you know we just it we turned up i said turned a blind eye to it right it was, it was so important trying to do other stuff we just didn't care about these clear flaws that he held um because you can't govern like that effectively for a very long time we said, okay, it's 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 we're willing to deal with this in order to secure a Ruzgan. And I mean it never fucking happened because you know the Khans, just like Gulag Ashurzai and any other strongman in Afghanistan, wasn't really working for the betterment of their province or their district. They were working for the betterment of themselves and their immediate family. But then when Matiula comes in, I think Matiula was a marginally better person than JMK. I, I think that's, that's that's a fair assessment to make. Um, Madiula came in and I think he, you, know, you, you read some of the stories, he and Razak seemed, got, a, got along pretty well. There was an understanding, keep that highway open because not only did it get, uh, soldiers and resupply up and down from the, between the provinces, but it made them both money, right? You know, 
you had Mariola charging for convoy security going into a Ruzgan, and you had Razik taxing the opium coming out of a Ruzgan. Right? It, it was a win-win for everybody. Um, and that all goes to shit when Rahimullah Khan shows up after Mariola dies. So I think what Rahimullah was Mariola's brother? Yeah. Or his nephew? <clears throat> Not yeah. So they, they they were brothers. Yeah. And so okay. you, you you basically had a uh, had a scar Mufasa situation where <laughs> where the uh, the the younger brother is upset that um, you know his his older brother essentially gets to inherit everything, and and you know Ma- Mariola was from I I I arrived you know months after he died, but from everything I read about him, he was he was a much more likable figure than than JMK and it, he had an he had an interesting uh there there was an interesting story about when he died that that I kind of kind of want to get into because there there was a lot of I, I don't know if it was just like public sentiment or what but there was the thought that his brother um Rahi Mullah was actually responsible for tipping off the Taliban about his whereabouts when he was killed and so Mariola was um, apparent, apparently kind of a kind of a ladies' man, not not a not, not a great Afghan Muslim as as it were over there. And he was going over to Kabul to uh, meet a lady friend or perhaps a prostitute. And when he got there, instead of uh, his his lady, there were Taliban there waiting to kill him. And so it's widely believed that uh, Rahimullah Khan basically let the Taliban know where his brother was going to be and got rid of him in order to kind of take over everything after he left. The unfortunate thing was that everyone, just like uh, Fredo and the Godfather, nobody really likes uh, Rahimullah Khan and he kind of becomes a pariah in a Ruzgan province. And because because of this, he, he ends up being a thorn in our side for several years and starts working with the Taliban. Yeah, he... That, so I, I would not be surprised at all if, if Rahi Mullah tipped the Taliban off on uh, Mariullah's movements, I wouldn't be surprised if any uh, relatively powerful political or military figure in Afghanistan had a relative who was, you know, in line to succeed them ever tipped off Taliban or the Islamic State or whoever, right? Because at the end of the day, it's about power more than anything else. Uh, there's also, so I was doing a little bit of reading up because like, you know, Rahimullah Khan just fell off the face of the earth, right? So, so Mariullah Khan is killed, and then Rahimullah Khan does not become the provincial chief of police like Mariullah was because, well, Rahimullah just doesn't have it in him, right? But he is a Khan, and that does matter in the Ruzgan. But after, what, Dan, six months of just being fucking useless, like he just disappears like off the yeah, face no, right. of the earth? Yeah, no, like like after six months of just ineffective operations, just constantly telling you, like asking for U.S. support, yeah, he just, like, like, like it seems like he just took whatever money he had and just ran. Yeah, I, I, I'm he, pretty sure that's what he did. And, and he wasn't, uh, he obviously wasn't the peacock, he wasn't provincial chief of police, but he was, he was put in charge of the Kandahar Aruzgan Highway Police, which was Rahim Mullah Khan's basic private, almost private military kind of thing that kept the route open. As far as I know, he was leader of that for a while. What he? I, I don't remember exactly, but I thought he did have some sort of leadership position, which is why he was such a pain in the ass. Yeah, he did. Like he, like I said, Zach, he definitely wanted to be the P cop, um, but then when he wasn't given that position, um, you know, I think he probably threatened some sort of retaliation. So then they gave him, you know, whatever position that they had available, which ended up being the, yeah, you know, the highway police chief. Yeah, I, when you talk about. Uh, the the corruption within Afghanistan, and it, maybe this doesn't fall into corruption. Maybe this falls into just just bad decision making. Like that is one of the worst decisions. You have a guy who, like Rahimullah Khan, is not incompetent or he's not ineffective because he's not his brother or his JMK was his uncle, right? Like it's not because he's not one of them. It's just because he's bad at his fucking job. Like some there are some people who are just bad at their job, no matter how much training they get, no matter how much coaching they have, no matter how good of a, of a employees they have, like no matter what industry it is, there's some people who are just bad at what they do. And Rahim Ullah Khan was bad at what he did because he did not have it in him to be a fucking warlord because warlords are not nice. Warlords do a lot of fucking work. Warlords have, you know, 16, 17, 18 hour days. And I think, you know, Rahimullah wanted the lifestyle that 
his uncle and his brother had built for him, but he didn't want to do the work to get the lifestyle, which is when you get things like Raza going up there and beating the shit out of him because he can't keep the fucking highway open. You know, for all the, for all the Gen Zers who listen to this, whose parents don't tell them, no, you, you will turn into Rahi Mullah Khan and you'll be useless one day. Uh, but he, he did become, this is, this is my personal opinion now after he like just fucking like, so he disappeared right around the time that pretty much everything except for FOB TK had fallen to the Taliban, like literally the entire province, except for FOB TK and the provincial district center, which I think it's in FOB TK all like everything outside of that. Those two things fell to the Taliban and Rahim Khan just disappears, right? He's nowhere to be seen anymore. And then what, like a week later, there's all these news reports in the AP about what's going on in a it's like there hasn't been a story about Aruzgan since the Dutch left in like 2012. How the fuck did they know what's going on in Aruzgan? Like, oh, we're pretty sure it was Rahim Ullah Khan tipping off the Associated Press about all the Taliban's gains up there and shit like that. And that's that's what he ends up becoming. Yeah, it seems like he uh, he he got he got a similar idea to the um, Game of Thrones character uh, Littlefinger that chaos is a ladder, and so <laughs> so you know if he. If he couldn't have his uh, his chosen position as a chief of police, where the where the real bennies are, then you know maybe maybe allowing some more trouble to to happen under his watch. I guess somehow in his mind he thought, hmm, if if things are going bad enough, maybe they'll maybe people will vie for the uh, for the old days when the Khans were in charge of uh, police in Aruzgan. So. Oh, I, I'm I have no doubt. And, and he was he was so much in conflict. You brought it up with, with he was so much in conflict with Razik in Kandahar from the time that he became you know leader of the Highway Police that you know Razik is now having to essentially be the the chief of police for Aruzgan as well, and so and Helmand. You know, I mean, Razik was doing operations into Aruzgan to clear the route. He was doing operations into Helmand at the time. Um, and and it was like that's one man. I mean, Rosick's a very powerful man, but it's like he was so fed up because that route was always open under Mariula that he has to deal with Rahi Mullah now and and uh, and Roz, basically Rosick's troops. You know, they're not getting supplied up in Aruzgan, so it's just an, it's a big nightmare. So I, I remember I think one time didn't Rosick like show up with a bunch of like building materials that he purchased for himself to like build yep. and construct new checkpoints and all that stuff along the route. Like, I mean, Rosick wanted that route open so bad and, and Rahim will just kept failing him. So like you said, he went up there and just beat the shit out of him one day. Uh, yeah. So that was, that was a good day. That was the last time bear fell, which was that September, October timeframe in 2016 where, uh, like we came into work and like, oh, route bear fell. I'm like, okay, we'll go clear the highway. And like, well, they're not going to do that. So, well, then they're going to lose, you know, transportation. What's the plan? So, well, Rosix, uh, he was heading up there with like trucks, these truck load, tra- like trailer loads of wood and shit to build new outposts along a newly constructed dirt route that goes up a mount, a literal mountain pass into a province that is what ninety percent mountain ranges. Like Aruzgan is heavily mountainous, and we're, we're, we're not going to have a hardball way to get into the, into the, the Southern edges of the, of the province. Like what could possibly go wrong? And that's when you saw the big Taliban gains up there. Um, I was reading a, uh, as an article just about, about Rahim Ullah Khan. And this was actually before or right around the time where he just ghosted the, the province. And uh, they're talking about the sentiment in the province towards the Khan family and how it had changed with Rahimula compared to Mariula and how it had improved with Mariula compared to JMK. And Rahimula's uncle, of course, it's his uncle, is like, oh, this is a you know a conspiracy against the Khan family and nobody, you know, they, they don't like us for whatever reason. It's because we're, you know, we're we're, we're Gilzai uh Pashtuns or we're Durrani, sorry, the Pobles are Durrani passion. We're, we're Durrani Pashtuns. And like, that doesn't make any sense. And then they go, wait a second. Ashraf Ghani is an Ahmadzai, which is a Gilzai Pashtun. So maybe, I mean, there could be some truth to that. I, I'm sure some of it may have been, because like you've said before, Kyle, like when, when Karzai was the president, he was really just the mayor of Kabul, right? And I think that Ghani really tried to preside over the entire country. And to the point that I wouldn't be surprised that he was trying to, you know, 
reach out to somebody like Rahi Mullah or whoever in Arugina that he could talk to. And he was trying to get them to do shit that he wanted them to do. And they weren't going to do it because of those tribal differences. I wouldn't be surprised at all. I think that's the big difference between Ghani and, and Karzai. I mean, apart from Karzai being relatively effective early on, Ghani being completely ineffective. Um, the big difference was that, yeah, Karzai would let these power brokers exist in their own little vacuum. And as long as they didn't um, step on Karzai's toes, he kind of let them do what, what he wanted as long as they kept their little parts stable. And, and Ghani didn't view it that way, and it's probably the Berkeley education, but, I mean, he didn't want his his nation being a an amalgamation of just different warlords controlling different sectors of, of his country. So, uh, I mean... Is, and that's what Afghanistan is at the end of the day. You know? It is. Um, and, and it's not it's not a new phenomenon. Like, like we did the whole great game episodes and we went back to the 17, 1800s. Like it's always been like that. Even when there's been a unified country, it's always been like so regionally controlled and contested that you can't really have a power broker up in Kabul dictating stuff. No, now when that power broker was Karzai, whose family is from Aruzgan and who was like you said, very passive and trying to control JMK and Mariula, then yeah, sure, whatever, right? But then you get somebody like Ashraf Ghani, who is, one, he's he's Western educated, which I don't think they're, they care too much about that, but they care that he was gone for 40 fucking years, right? Then he comes back and he's like, okay, I'm an Afghan again, I'm ready to help lead the country. And, you know, he's elected under uh, dubious uh, circumstances, if you will. Mm-hmm. I, I guess stealing an election is kind of dubious. Yeah, <laughs> I I don't know. When's Kabul going to get there? January sixth. I think that happened a few months ago. Yeah. That's a good point. They call it August fifteenth. Um, you know, you, you've got a guy who is not liked, uh, especially in southern Afghanistan, who is from the wrong side of the Pashtun tribe tree, and who is trying to dictate to the Khans after them having free reign in Afghan in ruse gone for over a decade trying to tell them how things are going to be like, it's it's a recipe for disaster right like if anything maybe rahi mullah in hindsight should have you know taken some advice from ghani but a large part of that was ghani and this whole anti-corruption campaign that they started up and like we, that's when we got into effective corruption versus ineffective corruption like once you start allowing corruption based on how good of a leader they are in military matters then you're going to have a problem because during the entire time that I was there and I, I heard us talk about these anti-corruption campaigns, never once did I hear General Razak's name, who is definitely not above board in most of anything he did in Kandahar. But we didn't care, right? Because he was it wasn't even that he was effective. His corruption was effective corruption. It's that his his milit- his, his tactics, his, his decision making, his, his operations against the Taliban were effective. And at the end of the day, we cared more about that than what they were doing in their private life. See JMK and the Bachibazi issues. All right. I was, I was trying to look it up to see uh, if I could remember who Siddiq, uh, what tribe Siddiqui was. Um, but, I, you know, I, I, I know we're focusing a lot on uh, Rahimullah because he had the, the familial ties to Ruzgan. But the uh, the peacock that was put in place, Siddiqui, um, you know, it was very much the the kind of anti-corruption uh, individual that you know Karzai or excuse me Ghani uh, was trying to put in place, right? Because someone that's not tied to the family, not tied to the region, um, again, like 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 I, like I forget his tribal affiliation, and I forget like exactly where he was, but I do, I, I do remember that he was a pseudo outsider brought in to you know kind of stop that corruption, and then you know. Like, you know, as far as effectiveness, like he just completely was ineffective as far as being able to start and have an effective operation and clearing uh, the highways within the Ruzgan, which, you know, like, like, I'm sure like you have that. And then you also have Rahimullah on the highway, you know, like also being ineffective. So it's just like layers on layers of just, well, he's not from within the province, so he's not being effective. This guy's from within the province, but he's not an effective commander so we're having that issue too so it's just you know from both sides in a ruse guy like you you know I, like at the time we were there like it, it was just really a struggle 
Yeah, and and it didn't help that in the midst of all like, so we just spent the last fifteen minutes talking about the the you know the the military and political leadership of Aruzgan, right? So during the entire time that all this ineffectiveness and ineptitude and uh, corruptness is going on, there's this whole insurgent movement known as the Taliban that uh, was just you know they were controlling Aruzgan, right? We when we look at it now, and I, I think about this as the Kandahar analyst, like, like were my assessments that places like Panjway, uh, speaking of the guys from the Panjway podcast, like that, like was it really green the whole time I was there, or was it just so heavily controlled that they didn't have to do anything, right? And you kind of get that feeling when you look at a place like Aruzgan, where, like, like we said at the beginning, it's so culturally conservative that I think the Taliban message is going to resonate there. You know, places like there and Northern Helmand and Kandahar more than it's going to resonate in places like Harat and Masri Sharif. And so the whole time you've got most likely in, in my assessment or my opinion, whatever you want to call it, a, a population that for the most part doesn't really want Westerners there. And they'll just, you know, play along when, whatever it takes to decrease their presence. Like, like we, we ghosted a ruse gone pretty relatively early, like what, 2012, 2013. And we just we were gone until we eeped back a couple of years later. Like that, that's a lot of time to not be up there and really, you know, keeping an eye on what's going on and trying to interdict this, you know, increasing insurgency in an area that is ripe for recruits. Yeah, is that when the Aussies pulled out? I know, I know they were there for several years. I uh, I want to say they left really early. I thought the Dutch were the last ones there. I, I know the Aussies yeah. and the Dutch spent a lot of time up there. Yeah. Yeah, and I was I always felt bad because because we'd have these you know Australian uh, guys that we were working with on camp and you know talk about a ruse gun. They're like, oh, I remember when I was there in like two thousand eight and stuff. It's like, well, it's falling apart still. <laughs> Sorry, man, yeah. but yeah, it was. I mean, yeah, think the situation in a ruse gun, you know, really dramatically deteriorated in our eyes when we started looking at it again, but it, it might've, it, it might've been really bad, you know, even it might've even been really bad during Mariula's time, you know, you know, like while you, he was keeping that, uh, that route open and he was the, uh, the peacock, you know, we, we weren't really focused so much on a Ruzgan because I, I think in the South, like Kandahar and Helmand took basically like the majority of us focus because they're much more, um, important uh provinces i mean H hellman being you know the center of poppy cultivation in the country that's the center of poppy cultivation and kandahar being like pro probably even more important historically than uh than kabul but far far more important and uh aruzgan yeah like you said was central essentially left alone i mean after after uh you left Dan um, when I was when we were doing the Eeps and we were trying to build out like the security picture of a ruse gun. I remember I, I spent like a couple days like really digging in and trying to see okay what is actually controlled and what isn't and I drew a lot of red on a map and not a lot of green. <laughs> there was there was probably more 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 yellow contested than uh, than green on the map and it was. It was it was just like once we actually had a clear picture of what was going on there, it was it was far too late, especially at that stage of the war. You know, sending and sending an EEP up there to try to make a difference when they're not the ones that are going to be doing uh, doing operations up there. I mean, I think I think we had special forces trying to do a couple operations there, but they didn't really have a large range that they could go to because the. Uh, the golden hour um, medevac circle had to come from uh, from Kandahar rather rather than the Eep, and so they they, they weren't able to um, to conduct a lot of operations. And the Eep was basically just there to oversee Afghan operations. So basically, during the entire time that um, the Eep was ongoing, they moved up to Tarankat, and the Taliban had essentially swarmed in from all sides and were holding a huge perimeter and they were trying to basically move up from the uh, provincial capital north into the uh, the Baluchi Valley in Tarankat and I 
think they made it about 500 meters before <laughs> the fighting got too intense and they couldn't go any further and that stayed true from my under i i wasn't i wasn't covering a Ruzgan for the the rest of the time i was contracting in afghanistan but i i kept up on it and it seems like that stayed pretty true for like the next four years until we pulled out <laughs> so it was the taliban pretty solidly had their their hooks in not only you know militarily but also in terms of controlling the population because Aruzgan is number four in uh, in poppy cultivation in Afghanistan. And so, you know, a lot of the people were working with the Taliban and making more money than they would be if they if they weren't. I remember looking at uh, looking at Deraou district, the Taliban were actually uh, that's the district west of uh, the provincial capital, Tarankat. The Taliban actually were implementing uh, Sharia law in in a lot of areas and people were going along with it because they viewed it as more fair than the like national government's judicial system like and that that's probably true in a lot of cases in afghanistan because you know the sharia law you know whatever you think about it they it does lay down very specific rules that you have to follow and you can't bribe your way out of it like when it when it comes down to to sharia and the like religious following god's rule side of the taliban in areas where they maintain control and they aren't really in an active fight with us they tend to they tend to clamp clamp down on that a little more and follow it more judiciously you don't you don't see compared to like the the city areas where you know people maybe go go see a prostitute or go get drunk or something like that you know rural areas just like america tend to be more you know small town religious and the taliban just had a very effective strategy of controlling all of these rural areas and aruzgan and helmand and a lot of these other areas in the south and it was it was very effective strategy for them to kind of piggyback on that too you know like i think a lot However, Ruzgan didn't even need to be directly Taliban controlled for a lot of these populations. So you even agree with, you know, Sharia law and uh, some of these more conservative ideologies just because, you know, honestly, like, like, like even when I was looking at it, it was like, you know, that, that West East route, like beyond like the sight line of those outposts along that route, like we, you know, we had no idea. So, you know, you know, you know, probably the product before yours, like like when I last did it, you know, it was just like we, we had a little bit of green around Tarancot, uh, you know, along Route Bear, because at the time it was open. And then east-west, it was all yellow. And then, like, going into Kazaruzgan and Shahidi Asas, you know, like, those were, like, we had no idea. Like, at that time, we, we assumed that the provincial capitals were under Taliban control. And then, you know, outside of what we knew beyond that highway, it was like we didn't know anything. And, you know, we, we just knew there wasn't an ANA or an AMP presence. So like for the, you know, for most of our assumptions, it's like, this is probably Taliban control or tribal control. Either way, it's not good for the, the, you know, the central government because, you know, you're having people probably implementing their own Sharia law, even without Taliban, you know, the Taliban forcing it on, onto some of these, uh, more rural populations. Yeah. So when we talk about, uh, you know, the, the tribal control, and I know we, we addressed it a little bit talking about culture in the first season, right? But when you looked at, I'm going to use Razak's tribe, the Czech side as an example, right? They are largely anti-Taliban. And I can't remember which tribe it was that they were, well, it was the Norzai, right, Kyle? That they were always like feuding with along the border for smuggling opportunities. Oh yeah, Norzai yeah. Czechsai feud is that's yeah. the yeah. So like the, but the Norzai were 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 pro Taliban because the Taliban basically were giving them their business, right? Like they were the ones that were helping them smuggle. Well, you get to like a Ruzgan where the Popozai, like we said, were not the majority tribe, but they were the guys in power. So all that ended up doing when you had somebody like JMK who was using that that authority to, you know, you know, get rid of his enemies and other tribes that that helped. All, the, all that would do was help, excuse me, push people who were maybe on the fence about whether they really want to support this Taliban uh, movement 
they just want to live their life and be left alone. You know, it's like they reach a point where they say, well, fuck it. I'm, I'm joining them. They have my best interests in mind. They want these Westerners gone. I want these Westerners gone. I want to go back to life as normal. This is what I'm going to do. I, I have a, a place like a ruse gone. I'm not surprised at all that, that something like that would be so prevalent, especially when we got involved and not to say that we, that, we have talked a lot about our, our meddling when you look at like our foreign policy and stuff like that. I'm not saying we shouldn't have meddled. Like it's a war. You gotta, you gotta get involved, but maybe when we went about doing it the wrong way, where you, you gave the minority tribe all the power and it pissed off 70% of the district or the province, which created more enemies in an area that is very hard to conduct operations. Like Stu was saying, like with the SF guys, one, you had the golden hour issue, but then separate from that, you can't really do a helicopter exfil into a Ruzgan because it's so mountainous that it's just going to echo, right? You, you realistically, in order to do an exfil for a, an operation in a Ruzgan, you got to do it from a, from a ground position. And there's no way the group guys are going to go up to FOB TK and stage there for a day or two with the Afghans on site. Right? There's no way that would have happened, especially in 2017. But you guys, you know, especially what you're saying, Stu, is like how in, in Dan, like, you know, well, we have all these unknowns and, and all these unknowns, we just assume, you know, tribal or Taliban control either way. We, we just don't know. We just know we don't control it. Right. And we know that uh, Afghan government doesn't control it. I think the events of the end of last year proved that a good majority of the country was exactly like that. We, we talk, you know, it, it's it's almost like they were already in position. I mean, they may have been in position since we were there, probably, you know, since 2015, 2016, ready to go, just waiting to turn the switch and install themselves as the government. That's how it feels. You know, mm -hmm. it almost felt like we had this like paper state set up of, you know, government officials in these, the large cities. And, and they were just waiting for the switch to flip so they could just be like, all right, you're out, we're in. Like, it, it's they already had the, the numbers, they had the support. It was just, we just pretended they didn't for some reason. That's that's the whole charts paradigm, right? Is, is pretending <laughs> everything's okay with our, you know, green, yellow, and red paddles. Like, just double and, down. And I think we did that for 20 mm -hmm. years, you know? We pretended everything was okay for 20 years while all these unknown areas, you know, because we don't have reach there are are fully in Tal uh, Taliban control. I think they were in Taliban control years ago. They just waiting for the right moment. No, I, you know, I, I like, like, I was definitely in that state. The, the entire time I watched it, and I'm sure, like, kind of like you guys referenced, like, so probably back since 2012, where, you know, like, like, once you lose control, or, like, the standard for what you, like, what control the province means just changes. It's like, okay, well, do we control most of the most of the district? Okay, that district's green. Okay, well, do we control the district capital? Okay, well, the district's green now, even though we control, what, 5% of the total district? And then it's, well, we control the provincial capital, so the, so, the, so the province as a whole is still green, even if we've lost every other district. You know, so, yeah, it's just like kind of like that cast, you know, that, that shifting of, like, what what success means and then until you know finally someone's actually like okay well what's the real situation look like and it's like well we control the route north and the capital and that's it yeah you know so it's like <laughs> you yeah, know you're yeah. talking about like people it's not fire. green anymore it's not yeah, green it's like, anymore <laughs> like, you know there, there's nothing to say it's green it's all yeah. red now and, and the the problem is is that despite you know despite all of us knowing this like the people that need to know it, you know, the the guys that are in the positions of power where, you know, they're able to make decisions about things, they they get our assessments based off of their requirements that show everything is fine. <laughs> and then by the time it gets to Congress, Congress sees that everything's going fine. And then they're suddenly shocked when the the country seems to have fallen apart in two weeks as we pull out. And I, th I think that's the Indeed. that's the real issue is that, you know, you have you have essentially like the the military like I don't know the 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 military like requirements for for something to have fallen are like far too forgiving like for us compared to you know what's actually going on and that that really hurts the decision makers. And, and I remember Dan saying the same thing about Zabul. 
like I, I remember you talking about Zobble too. You'd be like, yeah, I mean, we don't control anything in Zobble except maybe the governor's <laughs> palace. You know? Right, like you, like uh, you go yeah. beyond the highway, like like once you go beyond line of sight of any of those things along the highway, you know, it's like it's it's a big question mark. Like you don't know right. if the Taliban controlled that city. You don't know if the tribes control that city. Either way, they're not supporting the central government, and it's just like like at that point, like once you lose control of the high of the area beyond the highway, you've lost the province. It, like, you know, because like it'll take, you know, years to get that kind of confidence back. Where, you know, you start getting these smaller cities and these smaller districts actually start reporting back and being like, yeah, you know, like we need help or the Taliban are here or you know, you know, like any of that kind of communication. Just like once that stops, you know, it, you know, it, you know, you're the province is lost. Yeah. So. And, and if and if you're if you're them, then why why would you report it? Like you know you're not going to get support. <laughs> you know you know your su- right. superiors are you know doing the the same corrupt shit that you're probably doing. <laughs> you know filtering money, so there aren't enough there aren't enough soldiers to come help you, and there isn't like a political will to come help you because uh, Highway One's open. So why would we give a shit about the rest of the province? As long as I can drive from uh, Kandahar to Ghazni, then. <laughs> You know who really who really cares about Zabul? That's probably the way they they thought that uh, you know the bureaucrats in Kabul felt, and that's probably yeah, how well, they did feel. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you know, and kind of to Kyle's point, where it's like you know, then then we get shocked when all of a sudden the highway one Zabul is cut off because someone stacked like forty burning tires in the middle of the road, and we're like. Why are people doing this? And Didn't like, it happen oh. for like three fucking months straight? Just like every yeah. other week they yeah. were shutting down Highway 1 with burning tires? It's like, uh, well, shut down again. Like, you know, yeah. someone goes out with the plow, pushes them off, and then it's open again. And it's like, well, you know, great that you can open it again, but you have to understand that like, you, like you're losing the population if the population is doing that to the highway themselves. Like, like, because I don't even think those were Taliban movements. Like, I think that was probably oh. just people pissed at the central government. And they were just like, you know, like, you guys aren't stopping. Like, if you see these trucks rolling by to Kandahar, from Kandahar to Kabul or vice versa, but nothing's stopping here. So, like, you know, like, yeah, like, you know, I'm going to take my frustrations out and, you know, you know, make you send traffic for four or five hours. Yeah. Like, so to Stu's point regarding, like, you know, just, and we, we've, we've talked about this, about just the information not making it to the top and, uh, I, I did say that we, we can't say that anymore because uh, General Milley called out the boss when he said that the Taliban were staring defeat in the face, and he's now the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, so he he knew that that was at least the case. But like even absent him, you know, we we have talked about that where it just like the game of telephone turned into you know information either being reported incorrectly or being omitted altogether. And so like, at, at what point do they stop? interviewing people like Millie and Austin and McKenzie and start trying to find some of these brigade commanders from like 2012 and 2013 and call their asses to Washington. Cause I, I, I think about the, I remember seeing bumper stickers when I was at Bragg and at Lewis. It was like, you know, it, it basically saying not my fault. We were winning when I left. I'm like, no, we weren't winning when you left, dude. We, we, we hadn't been winning since like mid late 2002, mm-hmm. right? Like we, we weren't winning. But that's that's the mindset that is just pervasive throughout the mil- like throughout the um, I would say throughout the military where everybody's like, no, we were winning when I was there. It's like, no, we fucking weren't. Like, you, there's a difference between you doing your job and us winning, right? It's it's not the same thing. You know, like you can you can be a you know you can go out and kick a forty yard field goal because that's your fucking job. But if you're down by four, you're still going to lose, right? I think there's a lot of that mentality. Like we were always losing, but everybody would go. So we did what we were supposed to do. It's like, yeah, it wasn't a it wasn't a, a, a military failure in the sense of us failing to do what we were asked to do. It was a planning failure, right? Like the whole strategy was wrong. And, and Aruzgan is the shining example that nobody talks about because, you know, Hellman is sexy because that's where the Marines just fucking lived for 20 years, right? Kandahar, it's a spiritual, spiritual birthplace of the Taliban. Kabul is the capital. Herat, it's the cultural center of Afghanistan. Masri Sharif is this crazy no man's land where they play Bushkazi and there's a bunch of Uzbek warriors, but really it's places like Uruzgan and, you know, Western Zabul is where the war was really lost and we just bypass it altogether. Yeah. I described some to somebody like Afghanistan was 
Afghanistan was a 20 year war that was just a bunch of smaller little wars. And these little wars consisted of anything from fighting with your superiors to get your OER bullet points fixed or whatever, to like just wanting to go home at the end of fucking nine months, you know? And those were like the little conflicts that made up the Afghan war as a whole. So everybody's like, Oh, I did my job. You know, I did my job. I got in that damn plane every day and flew, you know, six hour missions every freaking day. It's like at the end of the day, like you said, no, it didn't matter because i I did my job. I, I, I fought my little conflict, but the, none of the conflicts ever matched up. There was no, there was no overarching goal and it all fell apart because of that. I think it's hard to have an overarching goal when the boss changes every 15, 16 months and the plan changes because they got to do something different. I like, could and you imagine justifies a green district changes? I mean, yeah. shit, everything changed. Everything changed all the time. And you're just like, well, you know, and, and I don't believe that the people that go and testify in front of Congress, I don't think that they're, you know, they can say, well, we, we the intelligence didn't say that. Of course it did. You're, I don't think you're an idiot. I think you knew that. And I think you just yeah. kept playing along because that was the cool thing to do. But I, I think you knew too. I think you knew how bad it was. You can't tell me you didn't at least once sit at one of those briefings we guys, we all did. We'd all sit around that table in the morning and tell all the horrible shit that happened the night before. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. yeah. You can't tell me you didn't sit in on one of those just to see what happened. Every yeah, boss but, but, did. I remember. Uh, I do not remember. Well, I do not. I don't remember the commander who was there at the time. But I do remember he came to one of our. Yeah, General Henry uh, and General Ares. General Henry. Yeah, they yeah, both he came, came to one. No. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, just yeah, just to emphasize your point. Yeah, and go sit, you know, go the, sit around and listen to a bunch of twenty-year-olds tell you how bad things are. And then you go pretend like it's not up in, when you're, you know, you're, you're a boomer sitting up there in Congress telling, telling Congress it's okay. Like, no, go listen to the people that, that don't really have a stake in it. You know, they'll tell you what the truth of the matter is. Yeah. And it's like, like the, the, the changing of the guard, you know, like really screwed up Afghanistan because we, I think we, we failed to treat it like a, like a regional war and we treated it like a, like a country war. And so we had issues where, you know, if if the previous guy wasn't winning the war and you're coming in to to be the one that does win the war, well, that doesn't mean that everything that the last guy did was wrong. <laughs> you know, maybe it was some of the things he was doing were working in some areas and, you know, in some areas they, they weren't. But it seemed like every time someone else came in, it was either the same old thing that wasn't working or it was, you know, taking taking areas where we were being effective and you know there was change being made and switching thing, <laughs> things up to where they weren't and it, it feels like the, the 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 recipe was just fucking like it had to be you go to the the command in Kabul and i swear like on the on the cg or commanding general's desk there was just like a three step fucking recipe for how to do this like you spend the first third of your time there explaining to all the units throughout the theater what the new strategy is. You spend the next third of the month losing the war because you're trying to transition to implement the new strategy. And you spend the next third of that tour actually implementing the strategy and you start to see successes towards the end of it. Every fucking time, that's what happened. You would have somebody come in, they change up everything. Any progress that had been made over the previous three to four months is gone. And then by the time they got three to four months left, they're back to making progress. But, you know, it's a whole three feet up, four feet down type thing. And, and, and it just it, it always worked out that way to the point that after 20 years, we're so fucking far behind that, uh, you know, finally, you know, the, the political leadership realized, OK, it's, it's time to just suck this egg and fucking leave. Right. It, it was just utterly crazy that we, we couldn't figure that out sooner. But in closing, uh, a ruse gone. Highly mountainous, highly controlled by the Taliban, probably the entire time we were in the country. I, I, I'm sure once the Taliban leadership left in 01, they didn't really leave Aruzgan. Uh, people that were in charge of the country or in charge of the province were the minorities within the province. And as we've told you before, in Afghanistan, what tribe you are fucking matters a lot more than in America. And then you match corruption, ineffective leadership, bad foreign policy, and really a Ruzgan is the perfect recipe for how the Taliban took back the country. Yeah. 
So, so before we sign off, I do have I do have one kind of interesting little anecdote from a Ruzgan. So the uh, Kaz Kaza Ruzgan is the uh, far eastern district of Ruzgan. It's it's it, it's been cut off from the <laughs> from the provincial capital since before any of us got there. Probably for for years before we we got there, and nobody really gave a shit about it. Well, the district chief of police in Kazaruzgan was actually a former Taliban guy, so he was he, he worked worked with the Taliban through uh, through the nineties and the early two thousands. And um, then at one point he got arrested. He, he was suspected of working with the ANA. And so he got sent to Pakistan to face trial and he was imprisoned for a number of years. When he finally got out, he was like, all right, I'm fucking done with this. He starts, starts to come back to go live in Khazarizgan again as a civilian. And he gets captured by the ANA because they know him as a Taliban commander. <laughs> so sometime during his uh, prison sentence with the uh, legitimate government, he decided, you know, what? screw this. I'm, <laughs> I'm so sick of this. I'm so sick of the, the Taliban and all this bullshit. So he decided to joined the uh the afghan police and he eventually rose up to be the uh, chief of police in kazaruzgan district during the entire time that they were cut off um, the taliban were making threats against him and one day the taliban basically surround him and lay siege to his compound he becomes the only surviving member of his family and at one point he was even eating grass to stay alive like they were they were laying into him for weeks Finally, he gets some backup from the police and they drive the Taliban off. And from then on, he was just rolling around Khazaruzgan like a fucking cowboy, going after Taliban. And what he would do, because they were so cut off, is he would go to Taliban um, uh, caches and <laughs> basically take their um, ammunition and food and pay and use it for his guys. And so... Uh, and I, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's dead by now, but he was, <laughs> he was just an awesome figure in, in a ruse gun. And, you know, there's, there's some, some cool things about this war, but I would be surprised if he wasn't dead. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's nuck and futz as they say, but maybe Mitch was onto something last year when he said, what if we had just like paid the Taliban a billion dollars for bin Laden? <laughs> just it's like save all this heartache. Because at the end of the day, cash is, is king everywhere. Yeah. I mean, that might be the, the new policy going forward is, you know, take a look at how much the Afghanistan war cost. Then, like, you know, if we're looking for, like, one individual from a group, just be like, all right, we'll give you the cost of an entire war so we can prosecute this guy. But we got we have to make sure that they have an inclusive government, Dan. Otherwise, they're not getting not any well. money. No, I want true. single combat between Mullah Barader and uh, Millie or whoever. <laughs> that's how i want to decide all future wars single just combat, combat. Yeah. just whoever yeah. this whoever the chairman of the joint chiefs is versus the leader of the other the other party it, it the other would change gets appointed chairman of the joint chiefs i do think <laughs> you'd, ha you'd have a lot more like highly fit 20 somethings as chairman. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, hey, well. hey, thanks for thanks for joining us this week, everyone. Dan, thank you so much for coming on. It's always a pleasure, sir. Good to see you, brother. Yep. Um, yeah, if, I hope you guys enjoyed watching or listening. Um, if you are watching on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe. Hit that bell down below and uh, leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this week's episode, and we'll be back next week. Happy New Year. Bye.